I have to do something I swore to you all I would never do. So let's talk about how I would write my own movie about Marvel's Thor. Don't get me wrong, I love the MCU Thor movies. I just don't feel like me personally as a Thor fan that I've been given the Thor movie that I would want to see. So I'm going to tell you guys what that movie would be. We open in Norway following Thorleif Goleman, a psychiatric nurse. We get the establishing scene of like the norm, his job, love life, social life, etc. And then we start the thing. One day while he's at work, an old disheveled man with one eye is brought into the hospital ward where he works. The man is screaming what everyone assumes to be gibberish, but is later revealed to actually be ancient Norse. And when that man sees this guy, he leaps at him and starts screaming the same two words at him over and over and over again. The old man is drugged, locked away, and this guy goes home pretty disheveled. And that night he goes home, he has a nightmare. He's fighting against an army of black and white monsters wielding a magical flying hammer. He wakes up screaming and he sees that outside is a massive thunderstorm. We get a couple more scenes of this guy going to work with the old man constantly verbally accosting this guy, but of course, you know, he doesn't understand what he's saying. And then we cut, and we are introduced to Dr. Jane Foster, an American physicist and engineer who for the last several years has been working for the Norwegian government, developing a supersuit in a super science facility known as the Dome. The Norwegian government is making a public announcement that they are opening basically tryouts to be their country's super soldier. Thorleaf sees this, and he takes the chance to get out of his workplace, which he just doesn't like anymore. Thorleaf goes to the tryouts and excels in all the physical and knowledge aspects, and we get a montage of like hundreds of people trying out, but lo and behold, Thorleaf makes it to the final three, and the two people he's up against are a little hint, 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 Red Norville and Eric Masterson. But the very final test is a psychological one, administered by the resident psychologist, Dr. Donald Blake and Thorleaf is chosen to be their Thor. Thorleaf is congratulated for this honor, and he is introduced to Lars Odinson, the billionaire who runs and funds the Dome. He's welcomed aboard, and he is brought downstairs to Jane's workshop, where he is introduced to the Megingjord suit, a super suit utilizing electromagnetic radiation that allows the user to fly, dampens impacts delivered to the user, and grants them super strength. This is paired along with Mjolnir, a massive axe hammer hybrid that has like a generator in it that allows for localized ionization that basically just gives the user electrokinesis. It powers the suit, allowing for all the other powers and all that stuff. And bada bing, bada boom, there's your sci-fi Thor. Thorleaf is giddy and he goes home ready to start training with this suit over the next couple of months. And he has another dream. This time he is walking through this gorgeous, fantastical city as onlookers chant for him, Thor, Thor, Thor. Thor. But as he's waking up, he sees a figure, a black and white figure like the one from the nightmare from before, standing in the corner of his room. As he jolts up and wipes the sleep out of his eyes, he sees that there wasn't actually a figure. It was just a coat rack. And then we cut to three months later. The Dome is having a big public announcement to introduce the world to Thor. And this dude flies in, lightning a crackling to applause. The Dome and the Norwegian government announced that their goal for this guy is humanitarian efforts purely, not war. So we're going to get like the environmental warrior Thor that we got from Ultimate Comics for the first little bit. And this guy's going to go out and start doing some actual just good superheroing work. And when he's done for the day, he's going to return to the Dome and have a meeting with Donald Blake. And that night, Thorleaf once again has another dream. This time, he is a young boy and he's being crowned as the crown prince of Asgard as everyone claps and cheers for him. And he smiles in his sleep. And then the camera pans up and we see that the black and white figures he's been seeing before, one of them is just standing over his bed watching this guy sleep. We get some more classic harrowing stuff, like he, he waters crops that need watering, he saves people from burning buildings, and he saves people from drowning from an overturned cruise ship. And while masses are gathering around him, cheering for him, he sees off in the distance that black and white figure. He makes eye contact with it, and he starts walking directly towards it, but it vanishes as someone passes in front of him. And this dude is quite unsettled. This guy returns to the dome, and he is given some pretty interesting news. 
They are expanding the Thor program into the Thor core. And those two finalists from before, Red Norville and Eric Masterson, they're back in their own Thor suits, wielding their own Mjolnirs, which would be like just the different types of hammers that have appeared in the comics that weren't Mjolnir. It's gonna be the other models of this thing. This is just the dome and specifically Lars Odinson sort of showing off that their magnum opus, their Thor suit, is not only not one of a kind, but it is easily duplicable. We then cut inside Lars Odinson's office where he's ending a meeting on the phone and when he turns around, one of those black and white figures is standing in front of him, except he's not surprised and he has a conversation with it and it tells him that this guy can see him. And Lars says, oh, all right, I'll have another meeting with the guy and I'll see what I can do. And so Thorleaf has another meeting with Lars and Lars places his hand on Thorleaf's shoulder and his eyes flash green. And he asks Thorleaf, what did you see today? And he explains that he saw an elf. And Lars sighs and says, you'll forget this conversation ever happened. Thorleaf nods and walks off. Lars sighs and returns to his office. He looks at the elf and he says, make it look convincing. We cut back to Thorleaf. He's driving home and he falls asleep at the wheel and he has another dream. This time, it's another battle with more dark elves, only this time it is violent. Like this guy is going nuts. And then he wakes up and he sees a dark elf standing in the middle of the road and he swerves to avoid it crashing his car, knocking himself unconscious. He comes to the next day in a hospital where Jane Foster and Donald Blake are there waiting for him. They are there to see just how he's doing physically and mentally after the crash. As the doctor said, he suffered a pretty severe concussion. And Dr. Blake manages to coax out of this guy that he thinks he saw someone standing in the middle of the road. But they assure him, there was no one there. You must have just fallen asleep at the wheel. Hey, we're going to prescribe some time off. Don't worry about it. You just relax and take it easy. But Thorleaf doesn't feel good about this because he knows what he saw. So the next day he goes for a walk and he passes the place where he crashed his car and he sees that across the street, some of the companies had security cameras. He goes in and talks to one of the shopkeepers who is friggin' leaping at the chance to talk to the Thor of their country. And so the shopkeep lets him look at the security footage and he sees nothing. He sees himself swerve to avoid nothing and crash into a wall. And he goes, oh God, I must be nuts. But then something catches his eye, splashes in the puddle that were in the middle of the road, but not just splashes, footprints left by something invisible. Thorleaf takes this as vindication and gets a copy of it and brings it to Jane to prove that he wasn't seeing things. She sees this and she agrees. There are footsteps in that puddle, but she's not thinking some sort of weird nefarious magic or nothing. She's thinking, oh no, another country has a Inte foreign intelligence officers trying to spy or sabotage our shit. We got to show this to the boss. So they go to the dome and they show it to Lars and Lars says he doesn't see anything. And when Jane is like, what are you talking about? It's right there. He puts his hand on her shoulder. Her eyes flash green and she agrees. Oh yeah. She doesn't see anything either. Thorleaf just saw that shit. And as he's like, whoa, what the fuck did you just do? Lars starts screaming for help and the other Thors come in and this guy tries fighting back against these people. And so they have to restrain him and take him out of there. We then cut to the mental hospital where this guy used to work as a nurse and the Thors are trying to check him in. And he is saying, you can't check me in. I don't give my consent. I don't think I'm crazy. I don't need to be in this hospital. And then his brother walks in, a man he's never seen before, calling himself Gunnar Goleman, his older brother. And he says, I'm his older brother. I am signing off on this. My brother is very sick. Thorleaf is dragged away, kicking and screaming. And then we see Gunnar's eyes flash green and he smiles a wicked grin. For the first night in this hospital, Thorleaf has another dream. This time he is in a gorgeous regal hallway, but he is yelling. He is angry. He is screaming that he does not feel guilt for what he did, that Svartalfheim had it coming. And then a voice from off camera screams at him, enough. And Thorleaf wakes up in a cold sweat. He is now in the hospital he used to work, and we see many of his former co-workers just sort of looking at this guy in awe. And we get 
a reverse of a montage we would have gotten at the beginning of the movie of this guy just doing his normal job, only now it's another nurse doing that job to him. And later that day in the cafeteria, this guy sees that disheveled old one-eyed man from before. He goes up to him and the old man is still speaking Old Norse and this guy has no idea what he's saying. So the old man just looks at him and starts saying the same words over and over again. Loki. 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 Back at the dome, we just get another little press conference thing. They just put out an announcement that, hey, Thorleaf had to step away from the program due to personal issues, but everything is going to be okay because the other Thors will more than make up for his absence. Then get another just beautiful little montage of the, the other two Thors doing good hero work intercut with this dude being locked away for months, slowly but surely losing hope and breaking down. And one night when he is at his absolute lowest, he has another dream, but this time he is a very young boy. And next to him is another young boy, but with dark hair, wearing green. And they are being chastised by a voice off camera who is telling them he is ashamed that his sons would do something like this and how it's even worse that they're lying about it. The boy in green is insisting he did nothing. This is nothing, this is all just lies and slander. But then this guy, confesses. He owns up to everything. He admits what they did. He apologizes for it. And then the voice from off camera walks up to this guy, puts his hand on his shoulder and says, I'm proud of you. The camera pans up and we see that this voice is the disheveled man from the hospital, only he is clean cut. He is looking good. He is looking regal. He is looking kingly. And then he orders the other boy in green who identifies as Loki back to his room. And he goes to speak to this guy privately. And he lets him know he's incredibly proud of him for owning up to his mistake, for being honest. He's still upset that he did the bad thing, but he's proud of his son for at least willing to face this, the consequences for his actions. And then he looks at this little boy and he says, I'm proud of you, my son. And those last two words, we the audience would recognize because it's the same two words the disheveled man was screaming at him at the beginning of the movie. The next day, Thorleaf once again finds the disheveled old man in the cafeteria and approaches him. This time, when he looks at this guy and he says those two words, we get subtitles and we see it says, my son, and Thorleaf responds in Old Norse, father? The old man perks up because this guy is finally, you know, speaking his language, and he asks the old man, what is happening to me? I am having flashes of a life that isn't mine. What is happening and the old man apologizes and says you've been cursed and i'm the one that did it and when he asks why did you curse me the old man says because you deserved it and that really pisses this guy off and he stands up and he shouts at the old man for that which causes some attendants to come and get him and drag him off but as they're dragging him off and as he's screaming at the old man it all comes flooding back baby there was this war brewing between Asgard and Svartalfheim for literally centuries. And Svartalfheim, they were the first to strike. They attacked a small village on, like, the perimeter border of Asgard. But in doing so, they killed one of his best friends. And in a rampage, this dude flew to the capital of Svartalfheim and started slaughtering dark elves. And apparently killed King Malekith's younger brother. Loki reports the entire thing to their father, and Odin has to punish this guy. In an attempt to try and avert the war, even though now it's almost certainly an inevitability, Odin super punishes this guy. He strips him of his godlyhood. He traps his god powers in his favorite hammer, wipes his mind, and banishes him to Earth, never to return to Asgard unless he learns what it means to be responsible with the powers he was born with. And Thorleaf, now officially Thor again, sits in his hospital room just remembering everything he's done, and he feels immense guilt for what he's done. The next day he speaks to the old man again, and now they're speaking as peers because he has most of his memories back, and Odin remembers who his son is, and they address each other as father and son, and Odin tells him, we have to move fast. Your brother is trying to invade Earth. 
he explains that after Thor's banishment, Loki was really trying to get his dad to make him the new crown prince. But Odin was like, no, I don't care if it takes like a century for Thor to learn his lesson. He's gonna learn his lesson. We, I'm 5,000 years old. I'm fine if it takes 100 years for this kid to figure it out. And that infuriated Loki, which Odin then tried to use in the war with Alfheim. Unfortunately, Loki just betrayed him, and he sided with Malekith and did a coup. Working together, Loki and Malekith were able to curse Odin in a similar way that he'd cursed Thor, only they left him with his memories, so when they threw him on Earth, they knew he'd be locked up for think people thinking he was crazy. And this is where we get the pretty important lore dump of why Earth is so important, because it is the central hub of so many different intergalactic wormholes. That's why the Asgardians called it Midgard, because it's literally the middle Earth realm of the universe. There's so many things leading here. It is basically the first step you'd want to take in galactic conquest. Odin also mentions that after Thor was banished, Asgard's enemies just came crawling out of everywhere because Asgard had lost their strongest warrior, so they need this guy to get his hammer back. Thor asks him, so where is it? And Odin says, oh, I sent it to Earth with you ten years ago. And you know what, baby, we cut back to the dome where we see Lars leading Eric and Red down to a basement. And he's explaining how the dome is able to exist off of the grid. And we see that the dome is built over an equal-sized crater that at the bottom of which is the actual mythological Mjolnir. And basically these big Tesla coils have been set up around it, just draining infinite lightning from the thing. Lars shuts off the coils and has the two men approach the hammer, and he orders both of them to try and lift it. Red tries, nothing happens. Eric tries, and there's a little bit of wobbling. And Lars goes over to him and just lets him know how proud he is of him. And don't worry about it, they'll get it eventually. And boom, we get a lovely thing of Thor and Odin planning and then doing a break out of the hospital. He utilizes his knowledge of having worked there for almost 10 years. They break out, they steal one of his former co-workers' cars, and they drive to the dome. They break into the facility, but are immediately confronted by security. And these two start whooping ass, showing what two big Asgardian warriors can really do. Unfortunately, unlike Asgardians, humans get slower and weaker as they age, so Odin is actually holding things up a bit. So this guy has to step in, and he just mops the floor with a bunch of these security guards. And then, Red and Eric show up in their Thor suits and start fighting. Odin gets knocked on his ass, and this guy has to do the whole fight by himself, and he basically just bobs and weaves because he's way too weak to fight these guys, and gets them to hit themselves until one of them is just damaged enough, he's able to rip one of the gloves off of these guys, steal his Mjolnir away from him, and crack the other guy upside the head with it before finishing off the other guy. Knocking them both out, they're not dead. And then as Thor and Odin are going inside, Odin is stabbed through the heart by a dark elf. Thor and this dark elf, the one that's been watching him while he sleeps, have a big old fight. Thor knocks the thing out, runs over to his dad and embraces his dying father. And Odin tells him everything is going to be fine. He needs to go get the hammer and he will see his son again in the halls of Valhalla. And then Odin dies in Thor's arms. And that is when Jane walks in and sees this. So all she sees is the carnage that this guy started. When he starts walking towards her, like trying to explain himself, she screams. And then she sees the dark elf stand up and she screams even louder, prompting him to whip around, beat the dark elf's ass again, turn around. But because that happened, the enchantment that was over Jane breaks and she realizes like, oh my God, that's right. The invisible thing, the invisible thing. Oh God. You're right! Oh my god! And Thor is like, that is awesome! Thank you for being back on my side! And then he points down and they both realize he's been stabbed in the gut by that elf and he asks for Jane's help getting to the sub-basement. And when they get there, lo and behold, who's waiting for them? None other! It's Lars Odinson. But Thor looks at him and addresses him as his true name, Loki. This causes Lars to laugh because, yeah, yeah, of course, he's been Loki and he starts shifting through all the disguises he's taken throughout this. So yes, he was Lars, he was Gunner, he was Donald Blake, and finally he transforms into his true Loki form, and he and Thor just have a little conversation. Thor asks his brother why he was doing all this, and Loki's like, are you for real? 
because you are an amazing tool. You are Asgard's deadliest warrior. We needed you, but we didn't need you. We needed the hammer, which had all of your power in it, you dingus. I used one of my many mortal secret identities to start this whole facility to one, cover up this hammer so that the government couldn't get its hands on it, and two, try and figure out how to break Odin's enchantment, but the damn thing is unbreakable. You just need to find someone who's worthy. That's why I concocted this entire thing. And then when I met Jane, the genius, and she designed this suit, I realized I didn't even need the hammer entirely anymore. We could duplicate a reasonable simulacrum of your powers. And what's better than having one Thor? Having a legion of them, you dumb dumb. So yeah, and eventually one of those idiots who I make sure I can totally brainwash would be worthy to lift your hammer and then I would have my own attack dog version of you. And so when I hold tryouts for this thing and you, depowered amnesiac you, showed up, I thought that was hysterical. Of course I chose you. If I could have you as my slave, nothing would be better than that. But no, of course, whatever Odin had done, whatever word he'd said to this guy, the, the curse started breaking down and this guy was able to see magic. It was all losing its effect. Loki's mind tricks were working less and less on him. He knew, like, damn it. All right, scrap the whole thing. We gotta make this guy think he's crazy. And so we did that. We got rid of you. We hid you away. But no, of course you come back. You always do. But the beauty of this time is that you're not a god anymore. And then Loki just starts beating the snot out of this guy. Just taking out centuries of frustration on his brother. Whooping him back and forth, beating him black and blue. And then with one final kick, he is going to finish Thor off. Thor flies, stumbles across the room, tries to get up, but can't. He's so injured. And Loki walks up to him and asks, any last words, brother? And Thor spits up some blood and says, yes. You love to talk. And we see that as Thor is trying to prop himself up off the ground, he's using Mjolnir to do it. And crack home! He is Thor! And look, I mean, no offense to the MCU, beautiful movies, but Thor has never gotten to dress like a magical space viking. For one movie, for one scene, for maybe five minutes, he looked almost like a magic space viking. But literally... Never again and never before. It's not my Thor, baby. I'm talking maybe a little bit of this mixed with a little bit of this, perhaps a little bit of this guy, but mostly I'm talking like a this. Yeah, baby, that is Thor. And so Thor just beats the snot out of Loki, drags his brother out of the dome. Jane is following and like frantically theorizing how all of this stuff is scientifically possible. And as they're walking out, they pass the hallway where Odin had died and Thor notices Odin's dead body is nowhere to be seen and he does a little smirk. And when they get outside, Thor apologizes to Jane for everything he put her through. And she apologizes to him for not believing in magic. And he says, not really her fault because magic is something you have to see to believe and then he calls for heimdall and the bifrost teleports him back to asgard and thor comes out in the throne room of valhalla and there sitting upon the throne fully restored is odin because the curse the loki done put on odin that could be reversed if Odin died in combat and was brought to valhalla dying a warrior's death yeah boy because Loki, nowhere near powerful enough to seal away the Odin Force. So when Odin's disembodied soul got back to Asgard, Odin Force done flew right back into that thing, and bada bing, bada boom, that's how you get an Odin. Odin and Thor embrace, they imprison Loki, and then Thor flies to Svartalfheim to talk to Malekith. He informs Malekith that Loki has been captured, and he's come personally to apologize for his actions that sparked the war and killing his brother. And Malekith is just sitting there, being the snobby guy, just drinking some wine. And he's like, yeah, I have 12 brothers, and every single one of them died being murdered by trolls when I was a kid. What are you talking about? And Thor is like, well, you, your brother. I, I killed your brother. That's what sparked the war. That's what did all of that. And Malekith just laughs. He's like, oh, you're serious. You, you believe that? 
that is so funny. And then he flashes back and we realize during all of the times when they were talking about the horrible atrocities Thor committed, he still did commit them. But Loki was the one who told everyone all the consequences of that. Loki's been planting all... Loki sparked the war. Loki did all this. All of this, even the depowering of Thor, so that Mjolnir is now a thing that you can get by just being worthy enough. All of that! Loki's plan. This dude flies back to Asgard as Malekith just laughs and says, Hey, be careful not to lose your hammer since that can happen now. And Thor goes to Loki's cell to find it totally empty. Odin and Thor talk and they realize, yeah, Loki is going for Earth. Loki is probably down there right now messing with stuff. And Thor says, I gotta go down there. I gotta protect those people and just look out for if my brother ever comes out of the shadows. And Odin's like, yeah, you gotta go. And so Thor returns to Earth. We see that Jane Foster is now running the dome. She's the new chief executive officer. And they've secured new funding to replace the lack of Lars Loki's funding from the European Defense Initiative. And they're working on new advancements through super science and superhero stuff. And then we just cut to this lovely field where children are playing. And an alien spacecraft descends from the skies. And three rock-like monsters crawl out of it and they spot the children and start walking towards them and then boom lightning strikes and standing in between the cronins and the children is thor the cronins look at him and ask and just who the hell are you thor simply smiles starts spinning up mjolnir and then title card drop thor god of thunder that's what I want to see!